please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Sandra Disser. It's said that linguists make some of the best lawyers, at least they uh, do better than just about anybody else on the, SA, on the LSAT. Um, probably because, along with classicists and philosophers, the other two top scorers, they actually stop and read the question rather, <laughs> rather than just dive in with the answer. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, my son is a lawyer. I have lots of friends that are lawyers. Uh, but I just love the way uh, language is woven into the fabric of the law. And I love the way that uh, linguistics, the science of language, can provide uh, the trier of fact with some uh, good, objective, uh, data-based uh, information that can perhaps inform their decisions. So without further ado, I'll just tell you about a couple of my, the cases, um, some of my favorite cases, I have to say they're mine. Uh, some, of the, some, of them, uh, some of the other ones I'll mention as background um, are famous ones even from the 1920s and earlier. Um, but I hope you'll get a little more of an appreciation for um, what linguists do for a living other than just nag people about their grammar, which we don't do. We don't care how you speak. We're uh, descriptivists, not prescriptivists. But people are always worried about how they're speaking around me, so don't do that. Um, so these are three cases, uh, one from criminal law, one from uh, labor law, and one from intellectual property. Um, the criminal law case uh, was, oh, actually, this one is not mine. This was one uh, that was done by my uh, friend Roger Shai at the beginning of his career. Um, the police in um, Illinois uh, heard of a, a kidnapping, and the parents came to them with a pencil-scrawled ransom note uh, with the following text. If you ever want to see your precious little girl again, put $10,000 cash in a diaper bag. Put it in the green trash can on the Devil Strip at the corner of 18th and Carlson. Don't bring anybody along. No cops. Come alone. I'll be watching you all the time. Anyone with you, deal is off, and daughter is dead. The police had no idea what to, go, what to do. There were a couple of suspects, but there was nothing that would elevate one over the others. Uh, so they went to, they called up the leading uh, uh, dialect expert in the US at the time, Roger Shai, um, at uh, Georgetown University. And they said, can you give us any hint as to what's going on here, who we should start looking at? And Roger said, give me an hour and I'll get back to you. An hour passed and he called up and said, do you have any well-educated people from Akron, Ohio? And they said, well, as a matter of fact, there is one person among the suspects, said from Akron, Ohio. He said, well, that's your man. <laughs> what did Roger see in this? Well, as you may have guessed, um, there's Roger, by the way. Um, Roger picked up on the fact that there, was obvious, there were obvious misspellings of simple words, can and cops. But they got precious right. They got diaper right. So Clearly, this was not an uneducated person, but it was somebody who was educated enough to get those words right and to sort of goof up the other ones so that, they, they, that the suspicion wouldn't fall on them. Uh, but the other part of this was the word devil strip, which we may not know. Um, it is a, a word for the grassy strip in between the road and the sidewalk, but only in Akron, Ohio. <laughs> Elsewhere in the country, it's called Parkway, it's called the Tree Lawn, it's called the Curb Lawn, it's called the Verge, it's called the Boulevard, it's called the Tree Belt, or it's called just a strip of grass in between the, the road and the, and the, and the um, sidewalk. Um, all Roger had to do was go to DARE, the Dictionary of American Regional English, this wonderful five-volume tome that, that tells you all these things, tells you what things are said where. And the beauty part of it is, is that if you're sitting in Akron, Ohio, and everybody talks about the Devil Strip, you don't realize that nobody except for people from Akron talk that way. And you think that you're hiding your identity, but you're not. Unless you're some kind of linguist that has put all of DARE into your mind, you have no idea what it is that tips people off about your identity. 
Uh, we have colloquialisms here in Southern California. If I were to say to you, I came here on the five from San Clemente, uh, people would say she's from Southern California, not Northern California. And that's because people in Northern California say, I came here on five. They don't use the article the. They'll say, I took 660 or 880. They don't say, I took the 660 or the 880. Does, any, does that ring a bell with any of you? But a lot of people don't realize that, and they'll just say it, and they think that they're just sort of you know, passing with the standard, unmarked American English. But they're not. They're giving hints about who they are. Um, if you call yourself an Angelino, that's fine, except nobody knows to call you that anywhere else in the country. Um, if you talk about the industry, other, other cities have other the industries. For us, it's the entertainment industry. Uh, but we use it nonchalantly without realizing that this is one more bit of, uh, of uh, uh, linguistic indicia. Regional colloquialisms for any carbonated beverage is one of our favorite ways of convincing people that we do things uh, differently around the country. How do you say it? Uh, the East and the West Coasts, sort of the, the areas that voted for, for Democrats in general, uh, call it soda. Uh, the Mountain West calls it soda pop. Parts of the Midwest, including Detroit and Buffalo, but not even as far as, uh, um, as Rochester, uh, call it pop. Detroit sometimes calls it red pop. Uh, Eastern New England, Boston, will call it tonic. And throughout much of the South, they'll refer to it as Coke, no matter whether it's brown even. They'll call Mountain Dew and 7-Up uh, Coke. Uh, but people think that this is unmarked, and yet you're giving yourself a clear label as uh, coming from a particular place. What do you call this? Uh, public fixture for, spring, uh, for sipping water. In the West Coast and the Southwest, we call it a drinking fountain. In much of the rest of the US, you call it a water fountain. In Boston and in parts of Wisconsin, they call it a bubbler, or actually a bubbla. Uh, but again, you don't think about it. And possibly, if, you're, if you live in Boston, you think that the entire world calls it a bubbler. But only a very tiny part of the US does. Um, I'm going to talk about a case now um, from 1984. Or, uh, where the, the, the regional accent isn't indicated by uh, individual words, that is lexical indications, uh, but phonetic, just general sound pattern indications. So it's not a particular word, but a particular uh, sound styling in your speech. Um, it's the case of people of California v. Paul Prince of Valley. Uh, back in 1983 and 84, 24 bomb threats were called into Pan American World Airways, the late great Pan American World Airways, uh, threatening their premier flag, their flagship flight, the longest flight in the world at the time, Los Angeles to Sydney nonstop, uh, with a um, with um, a bomb on board the, the plane, and 24 times they had to stop their takeoff and uh, come taxi back and unload all the passengers and unload all the luggage and bring in the bomb sniffing dogs. Everybody missed their connections. It was horrible, and this happened 24 times. Uh, Pan American, as you might imagine, was desperate to find out who did it. Yeah, the, te the text was, there's going to be a shootout tonight up there and a bomb going off, a nuclear bomb that's going to be able to kill you and everybody on the plane, and I hope you know it by now. 24 different times this came through. So they figured it must be an inside job. Anybody with that much animus toward Pan American uh, must uh, probably be closely related to it. Um, and suspicion fell upon this fellow, Paul Prince of Valley. Looks kind of like a thug. He wasn't the most, um, the most uh, innocent looking person in the world, let's say. He was a baggage handler. Um, and he had been kind of cranky about being given the graveyard shift, and he never liked leaving New York. He'd been a New Yorker all his life and was uh, moved out to California due to the Pan American, I think, Eastern Airlines merger. Um, and he was overheard saying, I'll get even with them. So this was not lost on his coworkers. Uh, his coworkers said, oh, that sounds like a New York accent. It must be Paul. Um, and uh, Paul's boss's boss and Paul's boss's boss's boss agreed. And they said, yes, there's a great resemblance to his voice. 
However, Paul's immediate supervisor, who came into contact with Paul a lot more than her two levels above her supervisors, and uh, more so than some of the people that Paul worked with casually uh, in the, at the airport, uh, the immediate supervisor disagreed. And uh, they said, the police said, well, you know, why do you disagree? Why do you think it's his voice? And she gave an A-plus answer for a linguistic uh, uh, course. Uh, she said it's, not a, it's a different inflection, accent, tone, depth, pronunciation, timbre. She had all these really good reasons to say, this is not Paul, and I know him very well. But they arrested him anyway. And <laughs> unable to make bail, uh, he sat in jail for nine months prior to trial. Um, back in the day, uh, one faced six to eight years of prison for calling in uh, bomb threats to a major airline. Today, they'd probably throw you into Guantanamo Bay and uh, prison and, and never hear from you again. Uh, but he um, did face some serious charges. And this whole thing seemed so cut and dry that in a post-trial interview, the judge uh, said, you know, based on subjective comparisons and on motive evidence presented at preliminary hearing, it would have been difficult for me to find Mr. Prince of Ali not guilty. So in other words, before he heard the linguistic data, he had his mind halfway made up. Uh, the defense team uh, consulted linguists at UCLA and University of Pennsylvania, uh, UCLA for the acoustics of it all, and University of Pennsylvania for the, um, for the dialect evidence. Um, and um, the dialect evidence was in the able hands of Professor William LaBeouf, who is by everybody's agreement, the, uh, the premier uh, dialectologist in America and the uh, author of the Atlas of North American English. Um, on our side, we focused on the overtones of the voice, the resonances of the voice that are set up by the particular size and shape of your vocal articulators, uh, the neck, the, the pharynx, the mouth, the lips, the soft palate, uh, the teeth, uh, the configura and of course the nasal passages as well. Those configurations will set up some distinctive resonances um, uh, depending on what you're saying and who is saying it. Uh, the lowest two overtones, the first and second, uh, are linguistic and they tell you what it is that's being said. So everybody that says E will have a particular configuration of the first and second, either close to each other or far away from each other. Everybody that says ooh will have a different set of different configuration. Everybody who says ah will have a different configuration. And you can tell what is being said more or less that way. The higher formants, uh, the higher overtones, um, three, four, five, uh, are much more indicative of speaker identity. Irrespective of what's being said, it'll tell you uh, a little bit about who's saying it. Um, let me show you what these look like. This is a sound spectrogram. It's a uh, graphic representation of the, uh, of the frequencies uh, uh, excited by the voice. Um, the uh, vertical axis is frequency, the horizontal axis is time, and the darkness just tells you how much energy is present. Um, the uh, unknown voice on the left is saying LA, and Mr. Prince of Alley on the right is also saying L.A. So I know it's kind of shady. We're sort of used to seeing these things these way, this way, but I hope you can recognize that the lower band, let's see if I can get this to work, uh, here uh, and the lower band here are pretty similar. Um, that's the first overtone. The second uh, starts high, dips down, and raises up again in both the uh, unknown voice and in Mr. Prince of Ali's voice. Uh, but the third one behaves differently. Uh, in the unknown voice, it's, it starts high and pretty much stays high. In Mr. Prince of Ali, it kind of just follows the second, up, down, and up again. Um, There are different dynamics uh, of the uh, third uh, overtone um, over the course of all these vowels. Um, high and steady third overtone, as I mentioned, in the bomb threat caller, uh, and one that is more dynamic, staying low and, uh, and uh, varying uh, 
along with the more linguistic second overtone, which is what Mr. Prince Valley did. Um, as it turns out, this is a trait that very much uh, divides the population in half. I have a colleague at, uh, a friend at, at York University, another linguist, uh, a charming fellow who said, oh, it divides up the world like sheep from goats. <laughs> so I like to think of, of, of the ones with the dynamic third formant as sheep and, uh, and the steady uh, third formant as goats. Um, in any event, in case you need any further persuasion, uh, I, this is just the results of a, of a, a little pilot that I did. It took seven voices at random uh, and checked out the covariance, whether the third formant uh, covaries with the second, I'm sorry, I keep calling it formant because that's the linguistic term, the uh, third overtone covaries with the second or stays independent. And you can see that they fall into two distinct populations. So I was very dubious that this was the same voice at all. Um, when I called Professor uh, Labov, that's William Labov in the picture there, um, I told him that I saw that the remaining uh, overtones, even the lower ones, uh, were different as well, suggesting not a difference in your pipes, in your, in your, uh, in, uh, in your uh, vocal tract, but in the way people use vocal tracts, which is their dialect. Um, so when I sent the tape to Professor LeBeau, he immediately identifies the, by the uh, speaker as having a Boston accent. Uh, Mr. Prince of Valley, no question about it, was a lifelong New Yorker. Um, Professor LeBeau determined accent patterns by graphing the two lowest overtone values, the first and the second, uh, on a formant chart. I'll tell you what you're going to be looking at. If you take the... Um, if you take the numbers, uh, the, the hertz values um, of the uh, frequencies of the first overtone uh, on the horizontal, on the uh, vertical axis, and the second uh, overtone on the uh, horizontal axis, um, you will get something that corresponds very closely to uh, the sort of chamber inside your mouth, uh, as long as you're facing rightward. Um, with a uh, front tongue position uh, over here in, in this area of the, of the space, back tongue position here, low tongue position here, and high tongue position here. Uh, it's a lovely coincidence that you can get the numbers to, to, uh, to recapitulate the, the structure of your mouth. Something was discovered back in the 17th century by an extremely young 12-year-old Isaac Newton. He actually got it just for the second uh, overtone, but um, it was just amazing that somebody like that could, uh, could, could figure it out just by, just by listening. Um, so what, did, um, what was Professor LeBeau looking for? Well, he wanted to find out how many vowel sounds uh, do these people make in the back of their mouth. Um, in New York, we, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm born in New York, uh, we use three. We have three different vowels in the back of our mouth. One is the sound in caught, one is the sound in cot, and one sort of in between is the sound in calm. Um, to Bostonians, there's only one. Uh, all three of those words, cot, caught, and calm, sound pretty much the same which is why Bostonians talk about having a hot dog. <laughs> Californians say hot dog. New Yorkers say hot dog. We all understand each other because our perceptual systems are used to this kind of thing. But if you, just, if you, actually, uh, if you actually graph it, you'll find, graph it, you will find quite a distinct difference. Um, so yes, even though um, uh, cot, caught, and calm uh, have different meanings, uh, they're pronounced all exactly the same, and Bostonians let, let context figure out uh, what's going on. Oops. So this is that kind of vowel chart that I was showing you, uh, with the unknown caller on the left and Mr. Prince of Valley on the right. And you can see that Mr. Prince of Valley's vowels uh, in that um, area where we'd otherwise be pronouncing things like ah uh, or all, uh, break into three distinct groups, just as predicted. 
he doesn't say caught and caught and calm, but he says positive and bomb and off uh, in a very different way. That you can see there's like three different different groupings. Uh, the unknown caller has a mishmash here. You have off here, you have off here, you have on here, you have on here. It's all basically random, as if he were from Boston and just basically making them all more or less the same. There's no, not that neat distinction into three different vowels that you see in New York. Um, the defendant, Mr. Prince of Ali, was ultimately acquitted after linguists demonstrated that the voices were uh, uh, unlikely to have come from the same uh, single person. Uh, the judge was very pleased with, uh, with, this, um, with this way of, uh, that we informed his uh, judgment in a data-driven and, and uh, objective way. Um, and I had to laugh. A couple of days later, the uh, Los Angeles Times interviewed the uh, lead detective, I'm sorry, no, the, uh, the prosecutor in the case, he was a very nice guy, and he said, I hate to think we went after him just because he had an Eastern accent, but maybe anyone with an Eastern accent would have sounded like the bomb threat called it us, because we're from the West Coast, and we can't tell them apart, which makes people in the East hysterical. Those of you who are laughed are probably from the East, because in, in, in the East, there are all kinds of little tiny little accent areas. Providence is different from Connecticut, is different from New York, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, but the West is one big, giant uh, uh, dialect area that that uh, hardly has any differences among them at all. And uh, we can't hear it because we're not used to, or people in California can, are, can't hear it because they're not used to hearing it, but they're there, and linguists can discern them. Um, why then even bother uh, with, this kind, uh, with this kind of analysis if you can get people to listen and use their fine perceptual systems to identify um, uh, voices? Well, this has been a long question in linguistics. Uh, why not just simply rely on people who assert that they can identify the person because they're so very, very well uh, familiar with them? First of all, ear witnesses do disagree now and then. I just gave you the case of the various levels of supervisors uh, in, in Pan Am who disagreed as to whether it was Mr. Prince of Valley's voice or not. Then there's a question of levels of familiarity. Um, yes, you can say it's a familiar voice, but is it a highly familiar voice like your sister or your best friend, or a moderate familiar voice like somebody that you see at work you know, weekly? Uh, is it a low familiar voice like somebody like your HR agent, for example, that you maybe see once a year? Uh, or is it a completely unfamiliar voice, somebody who accosted you in a park that you've never seen before in your life? Uh, there, is different, there are differences there. Uh, Question is, should unfamiliar voices even be placed on the same scale as familiar voices? Um, there's a good deal of work being done at UCLA um, on the notion that unfamiliar voices and familiar voices are totally different things, perceived different ways with different uh, portions of the brain, and should not be considered a scale, as uh, psycholinguists sometimes do. There's clearly an evolutionary advantage to recognizing your baby and to recognizing, uh, and to, for a baby to recognize uh, mom. Human babies have been shown to recognize their mother's voices in utero, so there's some kind of a bond being created even then. Um, it's very important for uh, immediate family members to find each other. Less important for them to find other uh, characters uh, in their herd. A few non-human species do pay attention to close friends. Uh, elephants have a, uh, a troop of about 100 voices that they recognize well and reliably. Uh, humans recognize lots and lots of voices. I recognize, all, I recognize my students. I recognize the announcer at the Dodger games. I recognize my husband. I recognize my kids. I recognize my kids' friends. Uh, we're way off the chart in the number of, um, of uh, non-family member voices that we, rec that we recognize. In many species, it's just mom and baby, and that's it. Um, unfamiliar voices is a low priority task in the animal world. Uh, it, they're of very little personal relevance to an animal. They're mainly background noise that get in the way when you're trying to find the baby penguin on an ice floe or a deer, little baby deer in a herd. Uh, 
animals at least uh, develop little, have little motivation to recognize such individuals. And perhaps as a result, um, we do, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we have developed different brain mechanisms to process familiar voices and unfamiliar voices. Um, highly familiar voices seem to remain in memory for a very long time, even permanently. I swear I could recognize my grandmother's voice if she came back to visit me tomorrow, and she's been gone for almost 40 years. Uh, there's little research on the other levels, moderately familiar voices or low familiar voices. Um, the unfamiliar voices, the entirely unfamiliar voices of aggressors, uh, uh, criminals, the kind of thing that the forensic linguistics is interested in, have been shown to remain in memory well for about a week or so, and then slowly degrade down to even chance levels of recognition. Um, you might say, but ear witnesses sound so confident. You know, the, 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 uh, the robbery victim says, I'll never forget that voice in my life. Well, successful recognition of familiar voices has primed us to to uh, expect that we can identify unfamiliar voices equally well. Uh, we can't. As my colleague Jody Kreiman at UCLA has said, in forensically relevant situations where listening conditions are usually impoverished re re relative to everyday listening, uh, ear witnesses are confident out of proportion to their abilities. Which brings me to the most celebrated ear witness of the 20th century, Colonel Charles Lindbergh. Uh, who, as I'm sure you know, suffered a terrible tragedy in his life. His uh, beautiful baby son was kidnapped uh, and held for ransom uh, back in the 1930s. Um, the colonel received a ransom request along with the baby's thumb guard, showing them it meant business, um, and, um, and he was instructed to send a family emissary uh, Dr. John Condon in this case, uh, with $50,000 in cash. Mind you, in the middle of the Depression, they wanted $50,000 in cash uh, to a darkened cemetery in the middle of the night. Um, when they got there, a Germanic, not necessarily German, but a Germanic accented voice said, hey doctor, hey doctor, over here. Uh, Lindbergh, who was sitting in, back in the car about 70 miles away, heard the shout and nothing further. The um, money was exchanged. The uh, perpetrator uh, gave instructions uh, for the, to, for the, to find the baby's whereabouts. And uh, they parted. The baby was not in the, accept, in the expected place. And uh, sadly, he was found sometime after that in a shallow grave a couple of miles away from the home. 29 months later, the police had a suspect. Uh, and Colonel Lindbergh, who of course had heard a voice in the darkened cemetery, <clears throat> uh, told the, the grand jury very candidly and truthfully, <clears throat> it would be very difficult for me to sit here and say that I could pick a man by that voice. This is 29 months later, hearing six words. Uh, later that day, the DA uh, uh, approached him and said, Colonel Lindbergh, would you like to see the man who kidnapped your son? And um, he took him to see uh, Bruno Hauptmann, who was in a cell, and asked Hauptmann to repeat those six words. And all of a sudden, Lindbergh said, it snapped in. He recognized the voice. Uh, in trial, when he was asked, uh, who was that, uh, whose voice was it that you heard uh, in St. Raymond Cemetery? Lindbergh said that was Hauptmann's voice. The resolution of the trial, as you probably know, is that Hauptmann was found guilty. He was sentenced to death and sent to the electric chair. Uh, jurors reported that Hauptmann's I'm sorry, that Lindbergh's testimony had been a critical factor in their deliberations. He was one of the most respected men in America. He had undergone this terrible tragedy. They weren't going to second guess him. Not long after the, uh, the guilty verdict, linguists began to scratch their heads and say, can we do that? Um, and it prompted the earliest modern work on speaker recognition, the first actually measurements of speaker recognition, rather than to say, I can do that. I don't think you can do that. 
uh, performed by Francis McGeehy in a couple of studies in the late 1930s and 40s. <coughs> As you can see from this chart, um, she played, it was a very simple, simple design. She played an unknown voice to a group of listeners who were asked to remember it, and then every couple of days for months, she'd bring them in and say, which of these five voices is it? Um, the, and they always contained the target voice. After a day, people were pretty good. 83% of them got it right. By about three weeks, it was down to 50-50 recognition, and after five months, they were at or even below chance recognition level. This is five months. We're talking about 29 months since uh, Colonel Lindbergh, uh, between the time Colonel Lindbergh heard the unknown voice and um, uh, then heard Bruno Hauptmann's voice. What role did the uh, anti-German sentiment of the day, remember this is not long after World War I, have in, con in convicting Hauptmann, a, a German emigre? After all, in previous communications, the person, uh, the perpetrator, uh, had identified himself as a Scandinavian. But uh, all of a sudden, it turned into a German, and all of a sudden, it turned into Bruno Hauptmann. This was not the most famous uh, case of uh, expectations, perhaps uh, tilting uh, speaker recognition. It's a story uh, that goes back to biblical times. Perhaps you recall, I won't give you the entire story, but uh, the aging patriarch Isaac, who was blind, uh, uh, was uh, about to bless his eldest son, who was Esau, but Jacob was his mommy's favorite, and she want, uh, and, and mommy wanted, uh, mommy Re uh, Rebecca wanted uh, Jacob to receive the uh, blessing. So she had um, Jacob um, cloak his uh, smooth hands with goat skins and uh, tell his dad that he was Esau, and what do you know? Uh, Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him, because he was blind, and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So even though he performed a successful speaker identification, he blessed the wrong son. He went with his expectations. He did not go with his perception. Um, expectations can be subtle as well. Um, they're not always quite as obvious as the, you know, you want to hear the guy who, you want to hear the voice of the guy who killed your son. Uh, sometimes these subtleties creep into our perception. Um, this is my professor at UCLA, Peter Latifoga, who came up with a brilliant uh, uh, experiment. It takes, took all two pages to write up, but we're still talking about it today. Um, he went around the group of 25 um, graduate students and professors uh, in his lab and said, I'm going to do a speaker identification test. Would you like to participate? So we all knew we were going to be listening, uh, and we knew that he was taping uh, members of the group. We all knew each other very well. We worked together, socialized together, so it was clearly we knew who these voices were going to be. Now, the only African-American member uh, of the lab group uh, had a breathy, high-pitched voice, and he spoke African-American vernacular English. He was not used. Peter put in a ringer, and he put in another African-American guy who spoke African-American vernacular English, had nothing like uh, Willie's voice. He had a deep, gravelly voice. He did speak African-American vernacular English. And what happened? Well, the first 11 voices who were lab members were identified quickly and without any errors. Uh, the twelfth voice was that, that interloper. Uh, it should have been clear to a bunch of linguists that this was a different voice, but half the subject fell for it. They just went into this like lambs to the slaughter, and they just said, well, the first 11 were lab members. Maybe Willie was having a bad day. Willie, maybe Willie had a cold. They all thought, it, you know, half of them uh, thought it was Willie. Uh, those who made this mistake were all skilled phoneticians. Some of them had PhDs in linguistics. Some of them were faculty members. And they just let their, their expectations uh, run away with them. Forget about, uh, about linguistic science. They were swamied by this test. I bring this up because there was a case a few years ago um, having to do with labor law, an instance of wrongful discharge. Um, during a uh, labor dispute at a Northern California oil refinery. Uh, there was a small embattled group of 15 
um, uh, uh, management uh, uh, staff who were trying desperately to keep the, uh, the uh, refinery online when over 800 workers were on, in a noisy, hostile picket line right outside their door. Um, while they were hunkered down there, and we're talking about weeks, they had, they, had, uh, um, they had the place set up like a little hotel for them. They had food trucks coming in, but they couldn't leave, and they, their nerves were frazzled. And all of a sudden, uh, a voice interrupted normal public address system chatter, and I apologize for this, but I wanted to give you data. I'm going to make it my mission to f all of you. Yeah, you stupid ass. So there were 11 words in the first sentence. Um, and then 11 minutes later, um, uh, there was another message, uh, four words, yeah, you stupid ass. Um, they were very upset. They thought that they were, that, that they were being threatened. Uh, almost all of them identified the voice as that of the strike leader, who was promptly fired from his lucrative job at the, at the um, refinery. Uh, question was, were they really highly familiar with him? Were they moderately familiar? Were they low familiar? Uh, after all, there were over 800 employees at the plant who were all, you know, angry and, uh, and, and striking. Uh, and by the way, the strike leader's own brother uh, was in the group. So at the very least, you might wonder whether they got the wrong brother. Um, Listener expectations clearly played a part in this instant identification because of all the 800 people, they happened to pick the one uh, with whom perhaps they had the most animus, the strike leader, the, the union official, um, who was uh, one of the loudest uh, uh, people on the um, picket line. Uh, further linguistic issues, well, there was an unfavorable uh, signal to noise ratio in that noisy industrial setting. Uh, there were only 11, um, uh, 11 plus four words. Uh, in terms of um, voice lineups, uh, we don't actually have any st strict guidelines in this country, but in England, they don't, don't like to use anything less than 30 seconds of speech. Here you just had a couple of seconds, five seconds. Um, even though I have a recording here, uh, that recording only surfaced later, and the, uh, and the uh, Identifiers only heard the voice once uh, and formed their uh, decision entirely from that. And there's something called co-witness conformity, which is kind of uh, what I call herd behavior, and not H-E-A-R-D, but H-E-R-D. When if somebody uh, shouts out an answer and sounds really confident about it, everybody else kind of falls in line. It's a natural tendency. People have studied this even with, with minutia like Half the people are given a blue card, half are given a pink card. When you ask them afterwards, if somebody gets up and say, I had a blue card, mine must have been blue, so I thought it was pink, but people tend to give up their, uh, their own percepts if there is a strong, uh, cohesive group that, uh, that, uh, that um, agrees upon one answer. And indeed, the refinery foreman had immediately gone on the PA system after this threat came through uh, to voice his firm opinion that it was the strike leader. And after that, hardly anybody disagreed. Um, I should just point out that uh, at the end, after about uh, a year of, uh, of, uh, of mediation, the um, strike leader was reinstated in his work. Um, intellectual property is another, another place where uh, forensic linguistics um, can be perhaps of help. Um, trademark disputes um, often involve uh, a, um, inf I should say infringement cases, often involve a uh, question of the likelihood of confusion of the, of the public. If uh, you're looking for Coca-Cola and you're finding Schmoca-Cola, uh, you're not getting what you wanted, and that is uh, to the detriment of the public. And that is always punished um, uh, by our legal system. Um, there is a sight, sound, and meaning standard so that the public can be either d deluded uh, by the way it looks, by the way it's spelled, uh, what the words mean, and how they sound. You can do a market survey to, to find out how many people think that Schmoca Cola is Coca Cola, but those do tend to take a lot of time and they're sometimes less than entirely subjective. 
Um, one interesting trademark dispute uh, came down in uh, district court in Oklahoma in 2004 between the AmeriQuest Mortgage Company, a nationally known mortgage lender, 6,500 employees, uh, $69 million a year in advertising, jingles, ads. They, they got naming rights to the uh, Texas Rangers baseball field. Uh, they were a big, big, big uh, player in mortgage uh, in mortgages back in uh, the early 2000s. Um, they were indeed the leading subprime mortgage lender in the entire country, and they um, were suing something called AmeriQuest Bank. Think of it, AmeriQuest, AmeriQuest. Uh, that had formerly been called the Guarantee First Bank of Oklahoma, but then suddenly they said, I think we'll rename ourselves uh, AmeriCrest. We'll just make up this name from the two streets that, uh, that uh, are near our, our um, bank in Oklahoma. And um, business boomed. Why did business boom? Probably because from all the $69 million worth of advertising with the jingle playing in the background or you call up directory assistance back when there was directory assistance. Maybe the uh, maybe the operator heard AmeriQuest instead of AmeriQuest. They're getting a lot of AmeriQuest business. They were they were um, they were um, dipping at their well. So AmeriQuest uh, got very upset and sued them. AmeriQuest's board said, "Look, this this new name might cause confusion, but it's not likely to cause confusion. After all, look, we have." Um, uh, in the, in the non-matching portions of the two names, we have a consonant and a vowel in one, and we have two consonants in another. So it's not all that similar. Uh, linguist who uses international phonetic alphabet would realize they're really quite very much the same because uh, the Q and the um, C are all just a K sound, just a K sound, which is the international phonetic alphabet symbol is a K there. So all that really differs in these uh, four-syllable oh, four words uh, is just, is just uh, one uh, consonant in each one. And what consonants they are. Uh, the sounds W and R are produced very similarly um, uh, in terms of articulation uh, that gives rise to very different uh, that's a very, very similar articulation, which gives rise to very similar uh, acoustics. Think about making a w and a r sound. You round your lips for both of them. You raise the back of your tongue for both of them. Both of those gestures uh, have the effect of lowering uh, our old friend, the third overtone of the voice. Uh, it's one of those few cases where, at least in this case, a consonant will, um, will be indicated by the third consonant third overtone and not the first and the second. Let me show you what it looks like since you're now, you've seen a few uh, sound spectrograms before. Here we have uh, AmeriQuest on the top and AmeriCrest on the bottom. And the W and the R show you where, about where those uh, consonants are located. Uh, you can see that, well, first the Amera and the Est are pretty much, are, are, are almost identical. Uh, but in the uh, W, you have a um, low first overtone. The R, you have a low first overtone, low and steady in both of them. Uh, the third overtone starts a little bit lower and goes higher, starts lower and goes higher. Uh, really, the only difference uh, between these two is the second overtone. Uh, which rises in the W and lowers, uh, or stays a little bit steady, slightly lowered in the R. That's the only difference in this four-syllable word between AmeriCrest and AmeriQuest. Everything else is, is uh, acoustically uh, identical. Um, I can go better than that, though, because uh, uh, linguists have access to something called uh, confusion matrices. Um, psycholinguists have spent lots of time uh, compiling charts of uh, the sounds of the language to see which ones are confusable with each other. Um, uh, just, you put listeners in a soundproof booth and play them a bunch of sounds, ma, ta, ka, sa, la, ba, and ask them to write down what they hear. 
Uh, it's a little bit harder than that. A little bit of background noise makes, makes it a little bit more sporting, a little bit more of a challenging task. Uh, so a listener can hear a W or the syllable with W, WA, but do they actually write it? Most of the time they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, if everybody's always correct, if hearing and, and, and perception are perfect, uh, only the correct answers will show up on the diagonal. What is intended is what shows up uh, in, the, uh, in the answers. Incorrect answers are scattered around in clumps, and that tells us uh, what parts of our language uh, have potential for confusion. So here's a confusion matrix of the consonants of American English, 150 tokens of each one. Uh, and some of them are recognized really well. T is recognized as T 145 times out of 150, uh, and maybe twice as G and once as TH, but pretty well recognized. Uh, other ones aren't, you know, are, 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 are mistaken quite a bit at a time. Like, for example, H uh, is recognized as H only 30 times out of 150. It's recognized, it's, 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 it was, uh, misperceived as P 49 times, as T 23 times, as uh, K 26 times. So you can kind of see that there are some places where there's very little mistake and some places where there are lots of mistakes. And that's interesting to linguists. And interesting to me when I took this case because what you see in that little blue box is, is that um, uh, a W prompt is recognized as a W 86 times out of 150 and 33 times as an R. So a really large number of mistakes, given the fact that this isn't a very noisy environment. This is, uh, this is not unlike a, 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 not a library room, but an, a normal, uh, a normal uh, room environment. Uh, we still make that many mistakes on the W and R um, pair. Uh, moreover, um, the W and R difference is lodged in a syllable bearing secondary stress, Americrest. And so it's only that crest, that last one that hardly has any stress at all. It's not in the mare that people hear because it's loud. Um, the difference is lodged in a, in a secondary stress syllable, but we know from uh, lots and lots of experiments that listeners attend more closely to the stress, the primary stress syllable. Um, also, the W and R differences at the end of the word, or close to the, in the final syllable of the word. And listeners and readers have both been found, over many, many experiments, to attend more closely to the beginnings of words. So for any number of reasons, uh, in addition to what you probably thought right in the beginning, those two sound very similar, Americrest and Ameriquest. Um, we could at least tell the, the, uh, the trier of fact that it's not just your, your perception or something that tells you they sound similar. We can tell you on the basis of acoustics and psycholinguistics and reading patterns uh, that, uh, that these uh, reading and, and listening patterns, that these things are highly confusable, among the most confusable sounds uh, of, the, uh, of the entire English uh, inventory. So what was the resolution of the case? Uh, a settlement was reached before trial. Uh, Americrest Bank changed its name to Coppermark, maybe from another two different streets in Oklahoma City. Uh, Americrest's lawyers were very happy, and they wrote the linguistic data had been instrumental in reaching a good settlement. Uh, not long thereafter, about a year later, the subprime mortgage business collapsed, and Americrest went out of business. Coppermark Bank grew to be one of Oklahoma City's biggest banks, and in 2012 was acquired by a competitor for almost $200 million. So they're, they're smelling like a rose. So uh, again, I don't say that linguistics had anything to do with it, but they're, they're very lucky that we, <laughs> that, we found, uh, that, we, that, we, um, that we found the way we did. Anyway, thank you. Any questions about all of this?